if you want to uh, have a little cheer like that, that's fine. But please do not disrupt the forum. Do not interrupt when the candidates are asking questions. Be respectful. Also, as I said earlier, if you want to visit, please step outside so the folks that want to listen can listen. Uh, also, please, no waving of signs in here. Uh, again, we do have folks from Farm, uh, farm Fest Management as well as enforcement folks. If someone's out of hand, uh, it will be dealt with. So again, please be respectful. Uh, this is one of the largest crowds we've had at a forum in many, many years, rivals some of our largest, so it's great to see that. Now, <clears throat> they can't, they'll get asked a question. Uh, the two candidates have 90 seconds to respond. Uh, when it gets close, I hold this up that says 15 seconds. And when they hit the uh, 90 seconds, I hold up the stop sign. And uh, that means it's time to wrap up. They can finish their sentence. And uh, everybody is always very good on that. And they will have a two-minute closing statement. There will be no break in here. Uh, the forum is being broadcast live on WCCO radio, and we'll go straight to, uh, through to 1150. It's also going to be live streamed uh, on, if you can go to the FarmFest website and catch the live streaming. So uh, with that, and that'll be archived, the, it'll be rebroadcast on WCCO later. With that, um, I welcome uh, both uh, Governor Walls and uh, Dr. Scott Jensen here. And I'm going to turn it over to Boyce Olson, WCCO, uh, to kick our forum off. Boyce, go ahead. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Obviously, a much anticipated event. Uh, we have about uh, one minute until we go live online. So uh, as Ken said, we'll, we want to make this a conversation. Really, it's the first of, I know, many conversations. I want to thank our ag leaders uh, that are on the panel here uh, and really uh, understand the issues in, in Minnesota, in greater Minnesota, about agriculture, but also there. Uh, I know both of these gentlemen pretty well, so I'm going to stay out of the way and let them talk uh, about the issues that are here today uh, as we get ready for uh, about 30 seconds from now. Um, uh, like, like Ken said, I, I just want to reiterate, uh, let's, let's give as much time for questions and answers and uh, in today's political climate, I think we can all uh, agree that today should be a civil and thoughtful conversation, and that includes the audience. So please uh, listen, uh, applaud politely, as my mother would say, but uh, don't make people notice you for outlandish behavior. Uh, Bev Olson would be, that's what her advice would be. So there you go. All right, three, two, one. Welcome to the Farm Fest Gubernatorial Forum. I'm Blois Olson, your moderator and host. I want to thank our sponsors, the Minnesota Corn Growers, the Minnesota Farmers Union, AARP, and Minnesota's Credit Unions for making these live broadcasts possible throughout this election season. Minnesota Agri-Growth as well, thank you very much. I want to thank Kent for organizing these. There's a lot of work that goes into organizing all these forums, and I think that this has become a Minnesota tradition. So. Here we go. We had a coin toss. Governor Walls won. He chose to go second, so he'll go second, uh, in, and then we'll rotate. Each candidate has 90 seconds to answer. Kent will be the timekeeper. Senator Jensen, first kind of opening question here. You've talked about a vision of healing Minnesota. Can you give a more specific vision of what healing Minnesota means right now and how you would uh, heal Minnesota in the next four years? Thank you. When I see patients in the office, we can't begin the possibility of healing until we ask the right questions. So if someone comes in and says, I've got chest pain, I would be a fool if I said, well, here's what we're going to do. So we have to ask the questions. And I thank Governor Walls that we're here today together because this is the start. We're asking the questions. We're saying, what matters to you? And I think through the process of asking those questions and having conversations across Minnesota, learning, listening, linking one another, that's the way we're going to, if you will, heal Minnesota. I do disagree with Governor Walls that his program of One Minnesota has become far less a reality and more almost an antonym of what we've seen. 
So when I say heal Minnesota, I'm talking about a transparent process where we go forth and we feel like Minnesota is being unleashed to become once again that beacon of economic activity, that star of the north. That's what we're going to do over the next four months and then over the next four years when we win in November. Thank you. Governor Walls, you did run four years ago on One Minnesota. Some of, uh, some of the political tone and tenor in the state and this country uh, is not related to your uh, theme of four years ago. Do you still believe One Minnesota is achievable, and what's your vision for making it happen? Yeah, well, thank you. Thanks to our sponsors. Uh, thanks to Scott for, uh, for running, and to each of you for caring enough about our democracy to be here. I believe in it more than ever. Um, my fear was, and I saw this as I represented Southern Minnesota in Congress, was that division was the politics of the day, trying to point out something, a problem, or why the other side is, is not just wrong, that they don't belong or they're not part of this. That's not how any of us grew up. We know that this economy is diverse in this state. The ag economy is one of the largest in the country. So is the medical device. So is manufacturing. Rural communities need to thrive so that urban communities thrive and vice versa. And I think what we've seen in this is we not only have the lowest unemployment rate of any state in history, we have the second highest job participation rates. We have the highest credit rating for state agencies and the fifth largest job growth. We kept deaths of COVID to some of the lowest in the country and we're starting to bring together the investments that were 20 years neglected. Things like local government aid in greater Minnesota. Things like the largest bonding bill that rebuilds our roads and bridges into all parts of the state. And ways that we can bring our politics. We can disagree without using profanities. We can disagree with believing our neighbors love this country as much as we do and simply find solutions. I worked with the only divided state legislature in the country and I am the first governor in Minnesota history to never issue a veto. That's because compromise is a virtue and not a vice. Finding workable solutions to move the state forward is what one Minnesota means. It doesn't mean we all agree. It means we work across differences to live the lives that are best for our family. If that's urban, so be it. If it's suburban, and so be it. If it's rural, so be it. But to keep dividing us and say this doesn't belong, that weakens all of us. We can do it. The next question goes to Governor Walls, and then we'll go to a, our panel next for a question. There's a growing tension between small and large farms. Some label large family farms as corporate. What can the administration do to ease those tensions and preserve the family farm? You can understand the reality of farming today. First of all, if you ask someone what's a corporate farm, they'll say anybody bigger than me, maybe. But what we know is, is that diversity on the land, there is a place for larger operations that can bring economy to scale. It's a hungry world. We are responsible and have the capacity. We are the place where the Green Revolution and Norman Borlaug started. So we need to have that. But there's also plenty of room, which we saw during the COVID pandemic, we were able to foster local growing butchers and, and to have our livestock market be able to diversify. When we saw our large plants not be able to prosper, we knew we needed more local folks out there. So putting money into teaching our young people, it's where my family came from. My dad's parents were butchers. They were immigrants and they owned a butcher shop in Tecama, Nebraska. Those types of opportunities, it doesn't have to be a competition. When we expand, whether it's into organics or into new uh, industries, whether it's Kernza or, or hemp, that doesn't mean that we have to take away from someplace else. It's not a zero-sum proposition. And the more that we innovate and the more that Minnesota grows those opportunities and the more we create export opportunities for those, there are going to be places. This is a false argument that it's family farms versus larger operations. We in Minnesota are proving that there's room for everyone and that the market is going to drive where we go in those solutions. So we're leading in this. We're prospering. We're creating vibrant rural communities and we're producing enough food to feed the world. That's the positive side of it. Dr. Jensen, Dr. Jensen, how do you see managing the balance between the tension between large farming, smaller farming throughout the state and preserving the family farm? I reject Governor Walz's comment that this is a false argument between family farms and that. This is not a false argument. Over my dead body will Minnesota ever sell farmland to foreign corporations. Count on it. If 
I have a patient such as one I attended in a motorcycle accident two weeks ago, and I check blood on him, and his potassium is okay, and I say to him, you're fine, but in the meantime, he's bleeding out, he's unconscious, and an hour later, he's dead. You know what? That potassium really didn't matter, did it? Well, that's the same darn thing we're dealing with the unemployment rate. If we have a 1.8% unemployment rate, but we have no GDP growth, and if we're in the bottom half of the country when it comes to growth of our economy, then the 1.8 doesn't really matter. And if we don't have Minnesota workers back to where we had in 2019, then it doesn't really matter. And the fact of the matter is, if you got the biggest raise you have in three years at 5%, and you're falling behind because inflation is 9.1%, then frankly, the 1.8% doesn't really matter. That's a false metric, and you folks see through that. Thank you. We're going to go to the panel now. Uh, the first question is going to be from uh, Minnesota Agri-Growth Chair and CEO of Compere Financial, Rod Hebrink. Rod? Thank you, Governor and Dr. Jensen, for being with us today. A key to the profitability for Minnesota agriculture is access to international markets. What specific steps would you take as governor to expand export opportunities for Minnesota farmers and their production? Dr. Jensen, you go first. What would we do to increase exports and make our farms more profitable? Well, the first thing is, right now I think Governor Walz has 34 or 35 key people and, if you will, department heads, commissioners. Maybe we should try to not just have a token of those people come from greater Minnesota. Maybe instead of having just three people from there and the rest of them all come from the seven county metro area, that would be a starting point. But the bottom line is we need to do value added investment into new crops things like that. Things that farmers have already done. Remember the biofuels? Remember the mid-1990s? Remember biodiesel? Over and over again, the agriculture community has demonstrated that it is ready, able, and willing, and absolutely committed to bringing new technologies to the market. That's how we get our exports up. If you want to really know how to get exports up, let's make sure that farms can be profitable. That means we talk about cost of goods. What are you paying for fertilizer? Why is there an additional tax on it? What are you paying for seed? Are you able to get the farm equipment when you need it, or do you have to wait a year and a half to get a trailer bed? What are the interest rates doing to you? We need to make the ingredients capable there for you so that you can absolutely succeed. And as you do that, you will drive yourselves and you'll drive your industry to make it even more profitable, and we will see new products brought to market. I talked to a fellow yesterday, farmer, and he ended up buying a tree farm. I said, why? He said, I don't know, but I'm always looking for new business opportunities. That's what agribusiness and greater Minnesota do. Governor Walls? Yeah. Well, there's probably not a place in America that knows more about global commodity markets, and I, and I do agree that it's, it's important to have folks that represent um, and are listened in the community. I'm proud of the work that Tom Peterson's done as commissioner. I also will note that um, my opponent's ticket is from the seven-county metro area, unlike myself, from Mankato. With that being said, these are global issues. What we can do here in Minnesota is what I've done as governor. We've increased agricultural outputs by 15% during my term. It's as high as any state in the nation. We've created new trade deals. Just this week, the first containers left the port of Duluth with kidney beans in them for Europe that came directly out of the folks in this room who went on a trade mission and set that up. We've invested in the infrastructure to make the port of Duluth the western terminus of the Atlantic trade routes to open up to the British markets and everything that happened post-Brexit. Minnesota farmers are producing on the world market. As far as when it comes to ethanol and the value added, it's the reason that my peers as governor selected me to be the chair of the National Biofuels Commission. It's the reason we were able to get E15. It's the reason that we were able to make and continue to work with our innovators in the biofuels uh, sector, make them the champions of the world. We've got the crush plant going up in Crookston and the and the uh, campus up there on bioinnovation. We've seen the largest investments that we've been able to make, and I want to thank the corn growers, put in a million dollars, the state put in six million dollars for infrastructure around that. We are competing globally. We are creating trade deals together, and the folks in this room made that happen. It's not a theory about global economic. It's about what are the results. Minnesota is exporting globally as well as any state right now. Governor Walls, you'll answer this next one first. Minnesota now has over one million seniors. Care centers and nursing homes were obviously stressed by COVID. 
they had a staffing issue before the pandemic and that staffing uh, situation continues. Families in Greater Minnesota want to keep their aging seniors close to home. What can we do to make sure that seniors can stay close to home? Yeah, and this, again, when you hear some of these statistics, whatever, if you're rooting against Minnesota being at the top, be, having the strongest state finances, having the lowest unemployment rate, having the fifth largest job roads, having the second safest highways and things like that, if you're rooting to see failure, that's what you're going to get. That's not the job that we're applying for. We're looking at the data and how it impacts Minnesotans. When the COVID pandemic struck and it hit working, there were times that the state of Minnesota had on strike teams that we were getting calls at 2 a.m. in the morning that there were no workers for our long-term care facilities. We were providing those workers with the teams that we had. We were supplementing them with our National Guard troops who performed heroically, but simultaneously, we were streamlining the process to license certified nursing assistants. It is the model for the rest of the country. It's been held up by the National Governors Association. We streamlined the process. We trained 1,500 CNAs. We pulled folks who were on the sidelines. We made the process simpler for them and we have them out there. Now when we're hearing from our long-term care facilities, it's always difficult to try and hire into these jobs because the wages need to be more. We need to pay these people to take care of our parents the value that they need. But right now at this point in time, the state of Minnesota has a pipeline to train many of these people to get them out there. We have a budget that would fund everything that's there and it is simply waiting to be signed. Walking away from the fixes for political reasons is hurting these nursing homes. We need to get back and have the legislature fix it, get done, and Minnesota can move forward. Dr. Jensen, what would you do to help nursing homes that can't find enough workers? Let's be clear. There is nothing about our response to COVID in regards to our seniors, our frail, our elderly, our assisted living, or our nursing home that would be a model for the United States. There's not one thing, not one. I have been medical director of nursing homes, and what we did by locking nursing home patients into their facility after we did this copycat of California and New York and watched them die alone, frequently bathing in their own stool and urine, is our legacy to what we did with COVID. This is what we did. Never again. Healthcare workers in the nursing homes feel like they have been driven away. They have been told if you don't violate your core convictions, you're fired. You went from being a hero in 2020 to being a zero, and these people are absolutely angry. And when you talk, when you talk about a legislative program going down, Rather than blame someone else or boasting, I've never done any vetoes, you don't have to do a veto if you have other people doing your dirty work. If they're caught on a hot mic saying, well, we can't vote for this even though we've been working on this for five months, we had some compromises worked out, but we can't do it because he won't let us. You know what's going on. Backroom deals, we can do so much better with our nursing homes. And one last thing in regards to the nursing homes. When you look at what happened with them being locked in, that's not a whole lot different than the students being locked out. It's not a whole lot different than businesses being locked down. This whole concept of locking down Minnesota just because you think you can is absolutely an abomination of government overreach. Our next question, our next question is from Lori Stavermer. National Park Producers Council Vice President. Lori? Uh, Governor Walls, uh, Dr. Jensen. Goes to thank Dr. You for Jensen being here. first. Dr. Jensen. Uh, Minnesota is frequently ranked in the top 10 in the country for taxes on both individuals and businesses. The most recent legislative session, there was work that was done to expand the Ag to School tax credit and expand the Ag Homestead provisions, both which would benefit farmers throughout Minnesota. How will your administration work? to make Minnesota a more competitive tax environment in a way that supports critical programs in Minnesota, but is not a barrier to growth for Minnesota's family farms. Dr. Jens. Ben Franklin once said, how much are you willing to pay for the whistle? If you have some little golden nuggets along with a huge spending bill, and then that goes down because people feel like an overpayment should be returned to the people who paid it, then someone's playing games with you. And that's what's happening there. 
We did get some broadband support for greater Minnesota, but that was because the Senate Republicans worked their tail off and the House Republicans held the line to get that off the goal, get it over the goal line. The bottom line is what we need to do is we need to work on the succession of the family farm. We need to reduce the state tax so that we can if you will, allow the family farm to stay in it. Governor Walls had proposed that we reduce the exemption from $3 million down to $2.7 million. We need to go towards the federal exemptions. We're one of 13 or 14 states that has a separate state estate tax. When farmland was going for 2,000 an acre, perhaps a $5 million exemption would cover, if you will, the succession from one generation to another. But when you're at 10, 15, 16 thousand dollars an acre and you've got a 500 acre farm, what you're basically doing is forcing many of those families to fracture their farm. Frequently, that's when they're most susceptible to seeing it broke up into pieces. And sometimes we've even seen our government's own agencies do an end around to buy that property, sneak it back, and you're actually paying for money with your money for them to buy land and take it from you. We've seen this over Time. and over again, and it has to Time. stop. Governor Walls, the question is about tax environment and competitiveness. Yeah, once again, the reality of the life we live in versus conspiracy or, or things you think might happen are very different. When you're in this job, one of the things is you work together. It's stunning to me that it, it, it's Senate Republicans in the minority who, when something good happens, they have credit. When something bad happens, apparently, that, that's not the way that works. The real issue on this is, is since my administration is, we've cut taxes more than any time in the last 25 years. There's not been a single increase in a billion dollars of taxes. We proposed this year and agreed to the largest tax cut, the largest tax cut in state history. These are reality. With that being said, what I proposed when I came in, it was 40% for the Ag to School exemption. It is 70% next year. Those are factual data. We proposed it going to 85%. The homestead exemption is in there. The elimination of the Social Security tax is in there. And the largest tax cut since 1858. Scott asked Republicans to step away so that it would look like it did not get done. That's what's broken about government. That's the game playing on this. Senate Republicans signed and went in front of the press and agreed to this. All they need to do is pass it and I'll sign it today. That's how this is supposed to work. There are solutions here. The state of Minnesota is setting on a surplus that I am asking to give back to you that was not generated by tax increase. It was generated by spending during the COVID pandemic. It should go back to the people who spent it, who now could make an impact on the things that are costing them more by using their own money. That's what we need to do. Next question is for Governor Walls. Governor, inflation is a major concern for Minnesota families, especially food costs. This audience has a very shared interest in making sure people are fed. The estimates are that 340,000 Minnesotans are food insecure. How will you make sure that Minnesotans can keep food on the table? Yeah, first and foremost, our administration, again, is asking for the direct relief. The long-term impacts of inflation are global. The United States ranks in about the bottom third of where inflationary costs are globally. Those are going to take supply chains to work out. They're going to take Fed policy and things like that. What Minnesota can do on this is, is the thing we talked about earlier. We can continue to grow our ag exports. Those make a big impact. We can also use the surplus to bring down the cost for all Minnesotans. That would be one of the most effective ways, and every economist would say in the short term, term, that's exactly what we can do. The food insecurity piece of this is we have done more to make sure our students are able to eat, making sure that the food programs that we work in conjunction with USDA and our partners like Second Harvest Heartland are being able to get that out there. But the biggest thing that we can do is put money back in the pockets of Minnesotans right now, allow them to do the things that they need to do, making sure one of the things that we're seeing on this is, is that our partners in the nonprofit and uh, whether they be uh, the NGOs or whether they be the church-based organizations, organizations, they have become incredibly efficient and effective about getting that out. This is a state that feeds the world, and any child going to bed hungry in this state, that's on all of us. And I think as our administration focused on those issues, focused on making sure, when all of the dust settled on this, they said the safest and best place of any state in the country for a child during the COVID pandemic was the state of Minnesota, and that's what we've achieved. 
Dr. Jensen, how do you make sure that every Minnesota family has food on their table? The safest and best place for a child was Minnesota? Interesting, interesting. About four weeks ago, I had a patient in my office, and she cried. And she said, Dr. Jensen, I've got $100 left in my checkbook, and I don't know if I should use it to fill up my gas tank so I can go to work, or if I should use it to buy food for my family. If we want to get Minnesotans secure in their food, we need to get them jobs. We need to get our workforce restarted. We've got to stop fracturing supply chains. We've got to do so many things different than what we've been doing. The fact is, when you incentivize people not to work, when you scare people from working, when you do all these things and you get them to sit on the couch and watch TV and you don't tell them how they could strengthen their own immune system, and when you take away options in terms of their treatment when they have a disease that we know, don't understand, when you give them a binary choice and you say, oh, too bad you've got the disease, go home and get over it, or get worse and then come to the hospital and find out that you don't have many options. When you do that to people, you scare them. And that's the worst thing we can do when we're in a crisis. We need to collectively, as Minnesota, rise up. We need to recognize that we all have to play a part in building the bridges that are going to allow Minnesota to once again be that economic hub of the Northwest. And we're not. We're not right now. The Midwest is looking for leadership. We need to step up and do it. And feeding Minnesotans is critically important. But until we lower the cost Time. of energy, we're not going to do it. Just to uh, do a time check here, we have about an hour left, so I want to thank our sponsors, Minnesota Corn Growers, AARP Minnesota, Minnesota Farmers Union, Minnesota's Credit Unions, and Minnesota Agri-Growth. The next question is from Dan Glessing, Minnesota Farm Bureau President. Dan? Thank you, and thank you for taking time today to, to participate in this forum. What steps will you take to support and encourage development in rural communities, making them a place the next generation wants to live, work, and raise a family? Dr. Jensen? That question is near and dear to my heart. What steps would I take to try to help communities in greater Minnesota flourish? I've traveled the state over the last year and a half. There is no question we need to do a better job of letting young people in smaller towns, in rural and greater Minnesota, know that there's tremendous opportunity out there. We need to start with aggressive, ambitious broadband connectivity that rivals exactly what the seven county metro area get. We need to let these young people know that there's opportunities in sales and research. There's opportunities in finance and accounting. There are so many opportunities. We need to be able to be so well connected in Sleepy Eye, Minnesota, that a business owner in Sleepy Eye can compete with an ad agency in downtown Minneapolis. That's what we need to do, and we can do it. It's within our reach. But we have to do something else. We have to realize that the greater Minnesota doesn't feel like they have a seat at the table. They need to have a seat at the table. You folks deserve that. Arguably, greater Minnesota has the most prototypic small business owners of anywhere in Minnesota. You know how to do it. Because at the end of the day, you know that the buck stops at your desk. There's no blaming someone else. You own it. If it goes down, you own it. And that's what we have to be about. We have to stand up bold. Minnesota is a marvel. And what makes us great is not our 10,000 lakes. It's our people. And you're up to the task. We are not going to get common sense from the Capitol or St. Paul. We're going to get it from you, and thank God for that. Governor Walls, how do you ensure the vitality of Greater Minnesota? I'm going to agree with Scott that our, our strength does lie in our people, but what you'll never hear from your governor is that Minnesotans are lazy. Hearing in a question that Minnesotans are lazy sitting on their couches while we watched 13,000 of our neighbors die, while we watched hundreds of thousands be put in hospitals, we watched the folks, go talk to the folks down at Center Care who provide most of the care out here, and ask them how that went. Instead of spreading false information, be part of the solution. When you're the executive of this state, you stand up and say, I take responsibility for this. I will put things forward. The way we talk to our children as a teacher 
to call our schools, which are the best in the country, we can always do better, but they are the best in the country, to call our schools black holes and disrespect our teachers and our parents and those that are working there is certainly not the key. Not having a plan to equalize school payments by making sure we don't predicate that on property taxes. And to say and divide us on this issue of broadband when we've had more investments bipartisanly than any other state, and you heard it that it has to be better than in the cities. The cities doesn't have broadband for their children. Trying to tell them this is the cities taking the money on broadband. This is a statewide issue. We're doing it to create those jobs, but it be come together to find the solution to recognize that we've invested $300 million bipartisanly and we're moving in that direction. But if you truly believe in the people, invest in our children, invest in our teachers, and don't you dare call us lazy. Next question. Next question starts with Governor Walls. Governor, Minnesota has been a national leader in the production of biofuels and the innovation of biofuels. It's been a direct product of Minnesota corn and soybean farmers. What role do you see for biofuels in the future of Minnesota's vehicle transportation plan? All right, this is one that we'll take. I'm going to thank everybody who's in this room who knew this industry was big 20 years ago. This is my 17th Farm Fest. We've been talking about this every single time. I believe in the innovation of our biofuels. I believe in what we've done. I was down at Guardian in Janesville last week talking about the efficiencies we got out of this. When anybody disrespects our biofuel industry, they're usually quoting things from the past. We've invested in the state in the soy crush problem, uh, or, uh, program that's up there to make sure we're able to process here. My peers across the country chose me to be the chair of the Governor's Biofuel com uh, Committee, and we have done more in this state to establish our Biofuels Committee in the state of Minnesota is being driven by the people you see setting in front of us. The people have made us a national leader. We need to make E15 year round. We need to make sure as we did, and thank you corn growers, put in a million dollars, we put in six million dollars, the grants will start going out, we'll start having our pumps at all stations. Those of you in here know, you blend to E35, you get the same mileage with the best reductions. This is all being a solution to the climate issue. It's creating jobs right here where you can take chemistry at Janesville High School and come back and work in that that plan and earn a decent living. That's how you create good, solid rural communities. We continue to make sure we invest. We make sure that our transportation system is diversified and biofuels are a key piece of it. We're only scratching the surface of what we can do. The advanced biofuels and the advanced fuels of the future are going to make Minnesota a leader in how we both address climate, we address carbon, and we create jobs. And I have done that as the chair of this, Time. and I've done it with all of you. Dr. Jensen, how do you ensure Minnesota remains a leader in biofuel production and innovation? Well, I have to confess, I'm confused. But I'm Norwegian, so I guess I'm entitled. If biofuels are the future of Minnesota, then why did Governor Walls hook our wagon to be a California copycat? I mean, if following the California rules by 2025, 35% of the vehicles sold have to be electric vehicles. And right now we're less than 2%. So in two, three years, we got to go from 2% to 35%. And in 2009, Governor Walls at a time was in Congress, stood proudly next to Congressman Eric Paulson and called on the Minnesota legislature to remove the moratorium on nuclear power. So what is the future? Is it biofuels or is it electric cars? Why are we doing this to our economy with California car mandate? When an F-150 electric vehicle pickup in January in Minnesota might have a range of less than 200 miles, why would we make you do that? Why would we tell auto dealers what they get to sell? Why would we follow California when the fact is they want to get rid of all internal combustion energies, including your lawnmower? I mean, if biofuels are the future of the, you know, the, our future, Governor Walls, then I would think we could back off the California car man and maybe you could stop that tomorrow. Wouldn't that be good? Thank Time. you. The next question, 
The next question is from Gary Wordish, Minnesota Farm Bureau Union, or, I'm sorry, Minnesota Farmers Union President. Gary? Thank you, boys. Um, during the early stages of COVID, when there wasn't any vaccination available yet, and our large meat processing plants had to shut down because of the workers getting sick, and in some cases dying from the, from the virus. It really exposed how fragile our food security system is. Obviously, we all know we need the large processing plants, but we also need to rebuild smaller regional plants, not only in the meat processing, but really in all of agriculture. You know, it's a consolidation issue we've been fighting for years. You know, we know we need the large, but we need to, re we need to rebuild that system within the state. How would uh, you, you as a governor work towards this? Dr. Jensen, you go first. The question is on the beginning COVID policies. And I think we need to be fair. Governor Walls was faced with a confrontation and a challenge that had never come to Minnesota before. And so for that, if you don't mind, could we give Governor Walls a hand for the work he's done? Now, to the point, one size doesn't fit all. We had cases in Hennepin County and none in some counties in Minnesota, and yet it was one size fits all. We're locking you down. That was the kind of policy. That's why so many Minnesotans felt that they were subjects under an emperor, and it made us feel bad. Governor Walls may protest with my comment regarding people hunkering down in their homes on the couch, but I saw it. I saw the weight gain. I saw the cholesterol increase. I saw the blood pressure increase. I saw the delay in diagnosis when I diagnosed breast cancer or heart disease. Folks, it was a dark time. We sat home and we weren't sure what to do. We were nation leading in terms of how many people were dying in our nursing homes. We knew something was terribly wrong. We all wanted to do the right thing. Do you remember the, the mantra? Flatten the curve. Don't overwhelm our health care facilities. We did that, but it kept going, and it kept going. And then we had the first lockdown, and everybody had long hair. Well, maybe not everybody. But the bottom line is, when the second lockdown came around, did you notice that you could get a haircut during the second lockdown, but not during the first? Where was the science? Did we learn that the COVID virus didn't like to eat off of a hair follicle? No. Time. It was because this was the kind of decision-making we did. We weren't Time. following the science. We were making it up as it went along. Governor Walls, thinking back to the early days in the shutdown of the meatpacking plants, what do we do to balance our supply chain and food security? That was a question. As governor, you'd have to multitask, and I'm going to answer this question directly, but I will ask, have you seen someone die who's unvaccinated from COVID? Have you seen someone with long COVID, a child? Um, and again, the information you're getting, and I would say whether it's about clean cars or, clean cars or this, um, on many platforms, this misinformation, well, they won't even let you speak this because it's not the case. And as far as making it up on the fly between the Mayo Clinic and the University of Minnesota and some of the finest institutions and the predominance of people making decisions on that. When it came to the meatpacking plans, the decisions we made in Minnesota and strengthening our work farm worker safety program, Minnesota saw far fewer deaths in our packing plants. They were up and running again, and we were able to process more of those animals than any other state because we followed the pandemic. You can wishful thinking and you can hope that, you know, COVID wasn't real and you can take ivermectin or whatever, but that is not where the facts are. And as governor, you have to deal with that. One of the things we saw was is the vertical integration in our processing of meat was putting at us both a health risk and an economic risk. So one of the things, we were the first state to start expanding out and opening smaller meatpacking plants. We now have about a dozen of our uh, local uh, technical colleges offering meatpacking skills so that they can get out there. We've got a whole new generation of kids who want to get out there, own their own meatpacking plant, do this locally, do specialized processing. All of you in here know, you know your local ones you want to go to, um, whether it's Smith's in Nicola or whatever it might be, you want to go there because it gives us that opportunity. We invested that, we invested another million, that's the way we strengthen that production. The next question is about the environment and regulatory costs and burdens on agriculture and greater Minnesota. Governor Walls, you'll go first. How do you balance the cost to farmers, the cost in greater Minnesota, while still protecting the environment 
Yeah, we can. I think it starts by, by recognizing that our producers are the ones that, that care deeply about this, whether it's making sure it's uh, soil health or making sure it's a fertilizer application, both from an uh, economic perspective but also from a, a health perspective, of, of making sure that we're incentivizing folks and giving the best practices on that. I'm really proud in Minnesota our Ag Water Quality Certification Program reduces those times that you need to get. You don't have to get as many permits. You don't have to come back. It's a voluntary program that's enrolled a million acres of producers. When folks come out and say we got to get rid of regulations, we got to quit doing all this, it's disrespectful for our producers who know that they need to do things a certain way. They do do things a certain way and our job should be to make those as less cumbersome as possible, to work with them in transparency and to use the science when it comes. We're dealing now with PFAS, the forever chemicals in our water. That water touches every single one of us. But we also recognize that our producers need to be given the tools, need to be given the support and I have been a big believer in conservation compliance that all of us benefit from that, that it is about trying to get those best practices out there, fund those best practices, measure those things, and see our producers as partners in both environmental stewardship and still be able to produce the food that we need. Here in Minnesota, that's exactly what we're doing. Can we do better? We can always do better. But I think when you tell producers that they don't care about this, they care. They want to make sure the water's good. They know that the compliance and the regulatory pieces of that should should be there, but we just need to make sure that they're as smooth as possible to make sure that we get the results we're looking for. Dr. Jensen, how do you balance protecting the environment and regulations in the state of Minnesota? I'm confused again. So the producers are being disrespected if we lower the regulations and the permitting processes. Okay. And what you heard was that the producers want the government to tell you how to be compliant and that the government will determine what the best practices are because you evidently aren't up to the task of ideally and optimally stewarding the land that you live on and pass on to your children and your grandchildren. This just doesn't add up. I would say this, it's relatively simple. Let farmers farm, let miners mine, let teachers teach, and let government get the hell out of the way. When does it stop? I mean, we can talk about ivermectin if we'd, I'd love to have that conversation. In 1976, we had a Legionnaires outbreak in Philadelphia. People were dying. They died because they didn't respond to, to the medicines we thought they would. And you know what we did? We didn't give up. We didn't go talk to Tony Fauci. We didn't go talk to Governor Walls. We kept trying. And we tried things and they didn't work. We tried off-label things and they didn't work. And then we tried erythromycin, and bingo, Johnny Ringo, we stopped the dying. That's exactly what people wanted us to do this time. Stop the dying. So I came out and I said, you can strengthen your own immune system. Do vitamin C, D, zinc. Get on quercetin. Let's do these things. Talk to your doctors. That's what I said. And I would say it today, tomorrow, next year, and Time. the rest of my life. Our next question from the panel is from Natalie Beckendorf. She's the Minnesota State FFA Vice President. Natalie? Yeah, I'm sitting here in my FFA jacket on behalf of the 35,000 students enrolled in agriculture, food, and natural resources. What specific steps would you implement to support career and technical education to address the labor shortage? Dr. Jensen. We've done a bad job of matching up our workforce needs with what we're encouraging young people to do. We've got to build a bigger menu. I remember in 1973 graduating from Sleepy Eye, and I remember even then there was discussion. Too many kids are being forced to go to college after two years, three years, four years. There was no real value gained. There might have been some student debt buildup. That's even worse today. We've got a post-secondary enrollment option program. We've got open enrollment. We've got all kinds of things and we need to now get those programs into the trades. We need to match up better. We need to tell kids, whatever you choose, it's okay. One of the things we don't realize is between 18 and 21, when kids go in a certain direction and they fall short, whether they, whether they disappointed themselves, their friends, their teachers, their parents, their grandparents, we put them in a place that's pretty dark. 
That's why we see so many 18 to 20 when you consider suicide. We need to do a better job. We need to invite you to the table with all the sincerity and earnestness we can because you have to help us solve this problem. You need to have a bigger menu. We need to be able to do something better with tuition costs. Maybe we go to the University of Minnesota and say $10,000 a year is the max, nothing more. We have to get creative. Somehow we have to do this. But it isn't fair to all the people who paid their tuition loans, who paid off their debt. It's not fair to say, oh, we're going to wipe them away. We need to be responsible. And remember, whatever you incentivize, you'll get more of. Time. <laughs> Governor Walls. Well, I agree with Scott. I think PSO is great. A government program, I might add. Um, this idea that you're, the, the, the idea that we can invest in our children and we've done that. The first thing that we can do is, and we did this, is we invest in our education system, making sure no matter where you go to school, you have a quality education. It's not a black hole, it's the best in the country. So we invest there. We make sure that programs, and I as an alumni of FFA, my jacket doesn't fit, recognize that in the rural community where I lived, that was a required course and it made great sense for all of us to have that um, that background knowledge. We can invest in the communities with things like broadband, as we've talked about, so these are livable communities. Then we make sure things like healthcare are affordable, and one of the biggest things that's drawing us back in the growth in our rural communities is affordability around childcare, of making sure we have that capacity there. Now you have the amenities that are be able to be there. We have a qualified uh, group of folks, and we do create these opportunities in our schools. We work with the trades to show that we can, there are numerous paths to a middle class education, but one of the things we need to make sure is that we're paying a living wage. It's absolutely outrageous as we complain about gas prices that British Petroleum made more money in the quarter than at any corporation in world history, even though a price of a barrel of oil is under $100. Those are the things that we can do of making sure an economy that works for everyone, an economy where everybody feels, feels a part of, and that our children know that that innovation and that investment is what we care about. To go back and tell them we're not going to invest, when we went to school, the generation ahead of us paid for it, we could go to school on minimum wage. Time. They can't. Invest in them. Time. Invest in them. Governor Walls, you mentioned it uh, in your last answer. The cost of child care is limiting uh, to bringing people back to the workforce. It has been an issue in greater Minnesota for quite some time. What can we do to to make child care more accessible, especially in greater Minnesota? First thing we can do is we can do what all states do, Republican states, we can use the federal government's ability to use CCAP funding to raise up our reimbursement rates, to pay folks a fair wage to be able to get there. That's one of the first things that we can do. And again, rooting against Minnesota, yes, Minnesota was the safest place for children. Yes, Minnesota was a place where our industry, that early childhood pre-K type of work was being done both in the private and nonprofit, um, and being done by the things like Head Start we see here in the Lower Sioux community. If we invest in the capacity, if we make sure that the economic model works, if we make sure that our families are incentivized to be able to use that child care, what we're seeing is, is we saw people leave the workforce because the balance between what they could get paid and what it cost for child care was about equal. We have the capacity to make this work, and and our business community, the Chamber of Commerce, the business partnership, this is one of their number one priorities. We had a bipartisan, nonpartisan group of experts take a look at expansion of the economy of what we needed in Minnesota, and one of the top ones was this investment in child care, bringing the CCAP reimbursement rate up to 75%, which you see in states all across the country, Republican and democratically led states. Those are things that we can do right now that will make a difference and incentivize those businesses and understand when our children and get that healthy start, for every dollar we invest before they get to kindergarten, we get $12 return in less social services through the criminal justice system and more productivity. That's what we can do. Time. Dr. Jensen, uh, how do you ensure that child care is more accessible and affordable in greater Minnesota? Government gutted our daycare. Government did that. One of my children has to pay $35,000 a year for two of their kids to be in daycare. It isn't working. It's absolutely broken. But there's this thing called waste, fraud, and abuse. We've had hundreds of millions of dollars fraudulently taken away from programs it was supposed to support. Why don't we try something different? 
Why don't we just get out of your way? Why don't we, instead of regulating and permitting daycare centers to death, let's not make it a government business and then come back to you and say, oh, now that we've helped you falter and you can't do it without us, we'll step in with a, a new program. We'll give you some money if you do it this way, but there will be some strings attached. Why don't we just get out of their way? Why don't we let moms and dads say, this seems to be a suitable place for my children to be taken care of. That's what we should be doing. It isn't all about government. You remember Ronald Reagan? He said, before we look to government to solve our problems, we should look to our neighborhoods and our families and our churches and our communities. Honestly, don't you think government has enough access to our kids? I mean, they've got K through 12, and now they want universal preschools. I think government is a big part of the problem when it comes to indoctrinating our kids. I do. I want my children and my grandchildren to learn the basics in school. And what we learn from homeschoolers is you can do that two or three Time. hours a day. Let's go that way Time. instead of government way. We'll turn back to our panel now. Rod Hebring, uh, CEO of Compere Financial, you have the next question. Both of you have mentioned the trade-offs between urban and rural. And uh, the population continues to decline in many parts of rural Minnesota. What one or two strategies or initiatives would you focus on to reverse this trend? Dr. Jensen, you go first. The question is, what would you do to reverse the trend of declining populations in rural areas? Well, I think that if you want to increase the population in any area, you have to have a, a robust economy. So again, I'd say let's get out of the way. Let farmers farm. Let agribusiness do what they do. We have been blessed in this state to have powerful companies. Just do a mental exercise for 10 seconds. Imagine Minnesota if we lost CHS, Schwann's, Articat, Polaris, Big Best Buy, 3M, Target, Cargill. What would we look like? We haven't had a major Fortune 500 company come to Minnesota since 2004, and that was Mosaic, and they have since left. We need to get government out of the way and unleash ourselves. That's how we get greater Minnesota to flourish. Like I said before, let's make sure the young people realize there's lots of opportunities. But we have regulated, permitted, licensed these various industries to death. We're doing it in all kinds of sectors. We're making hairdressers go through these processes. Every time someone says, well, let's make you register. That way we can control you. Then we get to weaponize someone. I happen to know a little bit about that because the Minnesota Board of Medical Practice has important work to do to protect Minnesotans. But when that group gets weaponized, whereby people are using it because of political ends, that's not just on me. If they did it to me, they'll do it to you. It doesn't matter what business you're in. This is not a good thing. This is not one of those moments to say, well, it happened to you. I'm not worried about it for me. We're in this together. Minnesota has a hostile attitude towards business, Time. and we've got to change it. Governor Walls, how do we reverse the trend of population decline in greater Minnesota? Yeah, it's a great question, and it's one that every state's dealing with. Demographic changes, we've seen this, you know, over the last hundred years as population shifts to more urban areas, as mechanization moved people into those areas. I think one of the things that we've stressed about in my administration and keep talking about one Minnesota is you want to have people to have the options. Myself, I graduated um, with 24 classmates, 12 of whom were cousins. My mom is still on the farm that's there, and that was the best education I could have gotten. It was a wonderful community. I loved the people living there. The opportunity for jobs to be there was relatively limited simply by the number of the demographics. I think one of the things we're seeing here by innovating in things like biofuels, by having the largest hemp crushing plant um, here in Minnesota gives us new opportunities. I think as we expand broadband, we do have the opportunity to live in a low-cost community that has wonderful amenities and great schools. We need to make sure, though, that we change the formula on how we're uh, funding our schools to not put the pressure on property taxes alone. And then we follow through with things like providing the child care options, providing the things that are necessary. People will then choose the life they want. For some people it's urban, for some it's suburban, for some it's in greater Minnesota. I think the disadvantage we have is, is when the amenities aren't matching up. It's one of the reasons why I couldn't understand for 20 years we underfunded the local government aid program. I ran on the idea to refund local government aid to make sure communities could build up the amenities to keep people in 
their community. That's how we do it. We don't just complain, and it's not a, it's not a amorphous, you know, big government thing. It's about how do you solve the problem. That's what the job of governor is. Time. <laughs> National Pork Producers Council Vice President Lori Stevemer, you have the next question. Governor Thank Walls. Thank you. The Singus single greatest threat to the Minnesota pork industry is the introduction of a foreign animal disease into the United States. Though pig farmers continue to work diligently on both FAD prevention and preparedness, there's still much work to be done to ensure we can efficiently and effectively respond. How will your administration continue to prioritize and invest in FAD preparedness and response planning within the Minnesota Department of Ag and Board of Animal Health? There we go. Thank you, Lori. Um, it's a great question. And this is where you get to see some contrast. It's one thing to talk about things. It's another to be the executive who has to take responsibility for it. This is an area that I have worked both as 12 years in Congress, as we wrote three farm bills, and we talked about biosecurity. We talked about some of the pathogens that are out there. We talked about an intentional terrorist attack on our food system that could disable this country. And what we were able to do is when we saw the bird flu epidemic, highly pathogenic avian influenza, when we saw it in 2015, it burned like wildfire. It burned through and we ended up destroying about 9 million animals. It impacted many, about 115 of our growers in that case. We learned from that. We put in the biosecurity. We worked together. The work that Tom Peterson and his team did with our livestock producers was absolutely phenomenal. When I'm even more contagious influenza came this time, transmitted by wild water, uh, waterfowl, that became very dangerous because there's no way to track that down. We contained that to about 80 facilities, we contained it to about 3 million birds, and we repopulated at a much quicker rate. This is about whether it's the pandemic or whether it's biosecurity around pathogens in our livestock industry. It's about having a plan. It's about working together. It's about executing. And trust me on this. You need government when something this big happens. And the collaboration and coordination that our agencies did saved the birds' lives, saved the livelihood, and put Minnesota back on the map as the number one turkey producer. And we need to stay in that place and make sure this doesn't happen with pork. We're ready. Dr. Jensen. How do you ensure that disease is not an issue for Minnesota livestock producers? Tim Walls, you need government. Ronald Reagan said, always fear if someone comes to your door and says, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. That's the contrast you're looking at today. It really is. In terms of, if you will, epidemics, pandemics, they've happened before, they'll happen again. This is not a new problem. This has gone on for millennia and it will again in 2002 with the initial SARS coronavirus one, we saw those folks that got the disease, and it never developed into what, what we were told it was, but we saw those, pol those people hold on to antibodies for at least five years. 85% of people still had the antibodies in 2007 and 8. But you were never told that. When you respond to a public health crisis, whether it's an endemic, whether it's a, a bioterroristic attack, whatever, you have to go to the experts. You have to go to the people in the field. That means you've got to combine public health people with physicians, but you've got to go to the pork producers. I talked with them yesterday, and they are as motivated as anyone to make certain that early detection happens, that containment happens, so that we can mitigate the amount of time that this is going to adversely affect the industry. Too often, politicians, Elected officials think that they've got the answers. They don't. We need to go back to the local place and say, what can we do? Veterinarians are thinking about this. I've got, talked with them regarding a variety of diseases, and they are watching and planning. But when we have a plan, we can't throw it out the window just because things get hot in the kitchen. And that's what we did with COVID. We had a lot of data as to what to do. Time. just got thrown out the window. You're listening to the Farm Fest Gubernatorial Forum on News Talk 830 WCCO. I want to thank our sponsors, Minnesota Agrigrowth, Minnesota Credit Unions, Minnesota Farmers Union, AARP Minnesota, and Minnesota Corn Growers for making this broadcast possible. Next question is from Dan Glessing, Minnesota Farm Bureau President. Dan? Thank you. Crop protection products are an important tool in a farmer's toolbox to ensure an abundant food supply. What is your view on allowing farmers to follow the label on those products which have been developed with scientific research and approval from the EPA when it comes to using those products? I, 
think the most important thing that, on this question is that we can't have government being a fickle partner. And that's too often what happens. The farmers do what they're advised to do. They, they follow the rules. They follow the labels. They do those things. And then it's not, and not enough. Someone says, hold it. You're breaking the rules. Again, yeah, I think it gets at a deeper problem. Farmers feel over-controlled, over-managed. It's no different than the way miners feel. I think it's the same thing teachers feel. I think that when we talk about teachers, we've got to be very careful and make certain that we're not lumping Ed Minnesota with teachers. Because there's an awful lot of teachers that aren't crazy about Ed Minnesota. So when we talk about teachers, we're not talking about Ed Minnesota. But I think what we need to do is, again, we need to let the agribusiness develop and grow. If the government's going to put some rules down, fair enough. Let's make sure that the appropriate people were put in place and were part of that process. But then once they're doing it, They've got to be protected as long as they're being, if you will, compliant with the law. But that doesn't always happen. Too often, Dan, the rules change. And this drives farmers crazy. And it would drive me crazy. It, did, it drove me crazy during COVID when I was told all of a sudden that even though 30 to 40% of my prescribing habits, which have been off-label for 40 years, all of a sudden it was no longer allowed. I could still use Flomax to help pass kidney stones, even though it was only for men's prostate. But I couldn't use ivermectin and some of these other things, even if my patients desperately wanted it. When did the patient become nothing more than a pawn in the process of government? Because that's what you endured. Off-label prescribing, off-label rules, it's all the same. We get Hi. to do it. Governor Walls. Well, I'm going to ask, answer the agriculture question. I think I think we have, we'll have more conversations about COVID pandemic and, and the response. Um, Dan, with, in reference to this, I think, again, this goes back to the question, uh, again, of our producers and our folks who are using these types of products are the ones that are most responsible. It's their land. They know what they're going to do. The issue is, is what is the regulation on trying to get that out and how to work with them on that? I think the consistency, and we saw this here with Dicambra, we know the issue of drift was a big issue for all of us, the drift and the damage that it was being done. The first year that that came out, we were seeing some of it. I think Tom and his people had 160 complaints about this that went out to see it. We worked together about the use of this. We found some parameters that worked with both the producers and the folks that were there, and we reduced the number of complaints last year to 15. So I think the working solution here is, is that we need to know that these are powerful chemicals. They make a major impact on both our ability to produce food, keep, you know, manage pests. Um, but we also know that there's, there's the impact on others and water and some of those things. I think we follow it. We work together. We've done this once again. This is not theoretical. This is not, you know, some stand-up or whatever. This is really happening right now. And here in Minnesota, I think we're striking a proper balance to, start to get where we need to be to both get the benefits of those products, but also to protect the public because we are all in this together. The idea that we wouldn't need to monitor water or that we wouldn't need to make sure a child wasn't shaken at a daycare, those are things that are just basic safety things that we do Time. together. That's good policy. Governor Walls, you get to start the next question. It's from Minnesota Farmers Union President Gary Werdish. Gary? With the growing concern of whether it's climate change or whatever you want to call it, there, are, there have been more weather events lately than uh, over the last number of years than we've experienced in the past. A uh, large part of the state was in a drought last year, and this year there's still parts of the state in a drought. Just a few years ago, we had a large, a lot of heavy snowstorms, took a lot of dairy barns down. This spring, we had a lot of wind storms, took a lot of barns. You know, what can the state, I know the state is limited to what it can do, but what can the state to help producers and communities through these natural disasters? Yeah, I, I think this is a group that knows the question about whether climate change is real has been answered. It's there. Minnesotans have been able to respond um, appropriately. This is a group of folks that are very resilient in this. Uh, last night, we had a fairly heavy storms that went out, but there's a system in place. Our local emergency managers responded. We had 29,000 people without power by about the last hour or so. That's been reduced down. I think one of the things is, is that preparation that we can do. We need to be resiliency into our infrastructure, understanding that we can't have the flood wall up in Duluth wash out because we're seeing 500-year waves. But one of the things that we can do is we can invest in those programs that make a difference for folks in there. I think, as Gary talked about, the dairy program of making sure we were there to respond. I think we should 
consider. We passed a great ag package, and I might add, those who wanted to kill the entire bill, we were able to pull out the ag package and the veterans package to get those things through. The things that were in there with the drought relief that was able to provide that relief, I think we need to think about permanent drought relief so that we don't get caught in the politics, so that they're able to provide the relief in the beginning. And then I think it's one of the things that you've heard. It's an all of the above approach. Pretty much, and just to be clear, everything that Scott said about clean cars was pretty much not true. The fact of the matter is that we're having a broad approach to this and our ag producers are going to be the ones from sequestration of carbon to the ability to look at crops that are more resilient and regenerative agriculture on the land. Those are the things. This is going to be a hungry, hotter, more disrupted world, but we can start to do the things necessary that both insulate us from those things, making sure that our infrastructure is more secure, but we can also have programs in place to support our producers. Time. Dr. Jensen, what's your vision for managing climate issues related to agriculture? I think we need to separate weather from climate. We see weather happen all the time, and we're impressed with it. We're impressed with this storm or that storm. Climate, we need to be careful. As scientists, we need to make certain that we're not arrogant about what we think is happening. And we do that, especially, I think, in this country. Because of the way we do science, the way we get it paid for, the way we get our research projects published, the way we get tenure, there's a whole cycle that oftentimes calls for more confidence and arrogance than really the science shows. We've used this term, follow the science, uh, ad nauseum over the last couple of years. But the fact is, I think there's climate change. It's gradual, it's slow. We have to be nimble. But I think the way we have to be nimble is we have to say, what is our plan? What are we going to do? To me, with some of these cataclysmic events that go on, one of the most important things we can do is spend our infrastructure money on infrastructure. Make sure it's not boondoggles. It's, it's not just some project to pay back a political friend or something like that. Let's really do infrastructure so that all of our roads and bridges can stand up to the heavy rains and the floods and all of those things. But again, we need to go back to the local communities. Nobody can know better than you how you can best prepare against these catastrophic weather events that will happen. And the bottom line is we stay nimble. We don't try to frighten you. We say, if we provided some sort of equitable funding to all the various counties in the state, how would you spend it? And try to get out of your way. But that's not what we do in government. We're always micromanaging, and we do it poorly. Yeah. Final question from our panel will be from Natalie Beckendorf, Minnesota State FFA Vice President. Natalie? Recognizing that stress impacts students like myself, peers and teachers, would your administration support additional funding to hire mental health specialists in our Minnesota schools? Dr. Jensen. It was midnight a long time ago when I got home and I had to call the Hennepin County Medical Center and learn that they had a body in their morgue that needed to be identified. So a few hours later I went down and it was my brother Bruce, and he had committed suicide. I deal with suicide every week in my office. I mentioned earlier that when we take 18 to 21-year-olds, we set them up for critical emotional and mental struggles. Unfortunately, Natalie, we have done nothing more than just talk a good game. We have had healthcare insurance companies reduce the reimbursement to psychologists, to therapists, to counselors. We've turned the world of psychiatry into nothing more than trying to determine the best and most optimal pharmacologic goulash that might work for them. We have not done the job. You have every right to be disappointed in the medical profession, in the politics of all of this. We've got to step up to the plate. So much of what ails us in all of our problems has to do with mental health. We're not as mentally healthy as we once were, perhaps. And I don't think all the technology and the phones necessary are helping us get there. We need to be able to look each other straight in the eye and say, hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that me as a doctor, I've probably fallen short. As a profession, medicine has fallen short. As policymakers, I think when I was in the Senate, I'm sure I fell short. We can do so much better. But unless we have you at the table reminding us and pushing us, it's not going to happen. Governor Walz. 
Well, I'm in full agreement with Scott that the health insurance companies certainly don't reimburse the way they should. It's a, it, it, it's a money maker. When you see in the paper that the highest paid executive in this state is the CEO of a health insurance company, that's broken. And um, I think those are things that we need to continue to work on. I think that's why, in the case of this, that we've expanded the ability for Minnesotans to afford health care. We were able to pass the reinsurance rate, so if your family is on the individual market here in Minnesota, we're able to keep those rates as low as we possibly can. Real things that make a difference. To the mental health of students, I spent two decades, I come from a family of teachers. This is the air that I breathe of working with these young people. Pre-COVID, these issues were there. The stress of the modern world moves very quickly. What used to be in-line bullying, I'll agree with Scott on this, is now online bullying, where you see people being stressed to that. When we talk to our students, they're feeling that stress. One of the things here in Minnesota for decades, we've gotten by on the cheap with our counselors. We rank 49th out of the 50 states in per capita number of counselors. These counselors are trying to figure out career paths and all of that to mention where we go. What we've seen is innovative programs over at Minneapolis Edison. We see the mental health part of this integrated right directly into the school where it's not go to a room and talk to somebody there. We have the services that are provided, both public and nonprofit, that are in that school helping them. And we're seeing results that are improving lives. This is when we tell our children they matter. This is why when you hear you're going to cut funding to schools, you're cutting money to mental health services and you're undermining our students. That's why we need to fund the programs that are working. Time. Just as we started, we asked about uh, Governor Wall's vision of One Minnesota and Dr. Jensen's vision of healing Minnesota. I can't think of a topic that would unite our state more than a Viking Super Bowl. So, to end on a little lighter topic, Governor Walls, you can go first. What's the Vikings record gonna be, and how far will they go in the playoffs this year? They're gonna win the North by a game, they're gonna split with Green Bay, and we're gonna get to the NFC Championship game. I'm only going that far. Don't okay. Matter. There you go. Dr. Jensen, the Vikings record, and how far will they go in the playoffs? I've got a running mat named Matt Burke. And he desperately wanted a Super Bowl. And he knew of our tradition, so he left for four years and got one in Baltimore. <laughs> Make of that what you will. He's a man of character and determination. I think the Vikings are going to do us proud. Hopefully they can do a better job of staying on offense because it's exhausting to be on defense. I think Governor Walls would say the same. When we're up here, it's fun to be on offense, not on defense. So I think we're going to finish second in the division. I think we're going to make Minnesota proud, and we're going to realize that the Vikings are on the right track. But I'm not optimistic about the Super Bowl at all. Got it. Realists, I guess. Uh, Dr. Jensen, you have two minutes for your closing statement. We need more cops on the street. We need restorative justice. We need judges that will stick to the mandated minimums. This has got to stop, folks. There was a teenage boy killed last night right by the light rail downtown just before the Twins game started over and over again. There is a poison of lawlessness that is bleeding out all across Minnesota, and we know this is a problem. we got to enforce the law. Got to. What I am most proud of during the COVID environment was that I stayed with my patients. I made house calls. We continued to have the conversations. Over 90% of my patients over the age of 70 with underlying medical conditions were vaccinated initially against COVID. I know what I stand for. And what I did not do was I did not flinch. I did not freeze. I didn't stop, stop, stop making decisions. Had I been in the governor's office, the National Guard would have been on the street sooner. This You and I together would recognize that the third precinct is a whole lot more than just a building. And you would not see the Christopher Columbus statue torn down by demonstrators because the governor said, okay, I will not freeze. I will make mistakes. I will make mistakes. You cannot be a family doctor without making mistakes. I will come up short, but I will keep trying. And in the end, when you talk to people that represent my departments, when you talk to my commissioners, you will not be talking to heavy-handed, mean-spirited leaders. You will see the MPCA and the DNR there to serve you. This has not been the way it's been going in Minnesota. We will do better. And 
lastly, I just want to tell you, when I was in the Senate, Governor Walls and I worked together to get an insulin bill passed. And it was an honor and a pleasure to work with him. He compromised and I compromised and we got it done and I think we well served many diabetics. Time. So again, I thank Governor Walls for working with me on the insulin bill. Thank you. Governor Walls? Yeah. Well, thank you, Scott. Um, the one thing I do know is, is if we could have had Scott Jensen apparently as instead of, uh, instead of Bud Grant, we would have won four Super Bowls. It's easy to guess after the fact. It's easy to say that these are the way things would have happened. It's easy to say there. And I just want to be very clear about this. Having served 24 years in the National Guard, that's a lot more experience than watching Top Gun Maverick and second guessing where our men and women are putting themselves at risk. That's a lot bigger difference. And they performed historically and they performed heroically. But the issue is this, we're facing challenges. When we face challenges, the solution is not to divide more of us, it's to come together. I'm proud in Minnesota that we were able to do that. Keeping our death rates from COVID the lowest 10 in the nation of state. Keeping our... Please. Keeping our hospitals functioning. Making sure that we were creating an economy that was resilient by now having the fifth highest job growth and the longest job lo lifetime of those jobs that get created. We are creating an economy that works for everyone. We're addressing climate change and not walking around it. We're coming up with budgets that invest in police and had someone not said kill the bill, there would be $300 million and three dozen more state troopers on the streets today. The governor doesn't make those decisions. We do them together. This job entails more than admiring a problem, second guessing. It requires standing up in front when they said, who's responsible for making sure we get tests for COVID? And I said, me. Who's responsible for getting us the vaccines out faster than any other state and more seniors boosted than any other state in the country? Me. Who's responsible for making sure that that job growth and those things went through? Dealing with a divided legislature and having a balanced budget with a historic surplus and no tax increases. We can move Minnesota in a positive direction together. Let's do it. I want to... I want to thank Governor Walls. I want to thank Dr. Jensen. I know we're going to have many more conversations between now and November. I also want to thank our sponsor, Minnesota Corn Growers, for making this live stream possible. AARP Minnesota, the Minnesota Farmers Union, Minnesota Credit Unions, and Minnesota Agri-Growth Council. I'm Blaise Olson. You're listening to News Talk 830 WCCO. Thank you very much. Let's, uh, yeah, please give uh, Boyce Olson and... Uh